The chapters leading up to chapters 9 and 10 in Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain cover three perceptual skills of drawing, the perception of edges, spaces, and relationships. In chapter 10, Betty Edwards covers the fourth perceptual skill, the perception of lights and shadows. Miss Edwards explains that drawn objects look truly three-dimensional when you get the lights and shadows right, which requires an understanding of light logic. Light logic breaks down all the varying shades of light and dark that you see when you look at an object into four aspects. Highlight, cast shadow, reflected light, and crest shadow. The highlights are the brightest areas where the light is falling most directly on the object. The cast shadows are the darkest areas where the object you're seeing is blocking the light source. Reflected light is the dimmer light that bounces off the surfaces around the object and illuminates the object with less intensity than the direct light seen in the highlights. Crest shadows are the more subtle shadows you see on the edge of a rounded form between the highlights and the reflected light. Crest shadows are what really make an object seem round and three-dimensional. Miss Edwards points out that there are thousands of gradations between the pure white of a paper you are drawing on and the blackest mark you could make with your pencil but seeing the four basic elements of light logic and then recognizing the gradations between them is the way to unlock realistic shading and drawing. According to Miss Edwards, the areas of shifting light and shadow you see when looking at a 3D object are tailor-made for the perception by your brain in right-side mode. The chapter then moves on to a discussion of the three basic portrait poses, frontal, profile, and three-quarter view, and how to ensure that the proportions are maintained regardless of the pose. Finally, this chapter discusses cross-hatching technique and shading into a continuous tone. In the first exercise in the workbook, we work on drawing eggs, eggs in a carton. First, you draw a copy of an example drawing that is provided in the workbook from Miss Edwards, where she is showing how to depict the rounded forms and curves of uh, an egg. Um, eggs are useful for practicing uh, all these types of shading techniques because they have highlights and crest shadows and cast shadows and uh, the crest shadows are very apparent on the surface of the egg because they're a nice rounded shape. Now it's easier I guess to start copying from a drawing rather than copying from real life because you've already got the example of how this is being reduced into two dimensions. The uh, exercise calls for you to start with a number two pencil and start with a ground of graphite laid out and rubbed down, but then to erase and then use your charcoal to darken the shadows. Once you've done the copy of the drawing, you're supposed to move on to drawing from real life. So got a few eggs in a carton, set them out, and then I lit them just with the same light that I use to light the work area for the videos. So it's all coming from this set of two overhead lamps coming from the left shining down onto the eggs. Now the eggs that I was drawing from real life, they were in a foam carton, and the carton with all of the foam surfaces, were they were really shiny almost luminous, and so there was a lot of reflecting going on and a lot of weird highlights and shadows and things that uh, were challenging to capture. And an egg carton, I'd never really thought about it before, but it has a lot of different shapes and facets because of all of the slots where the eggs have to fit. So there are a lot of little corners and edges where light's bouncing around and shadows are being cast, and it's a kind of complex object, when you look at it visually, there are a lot of just weird shapes in there that don't really correspond to anything that you're used to thinking about in terms of uh, a proper noun. So you don't have names for any of these shapes, so uh, that's a good thing according to the book because then you're not using the left side of your brain to label these things, you're just perceiving the shapes and then uh, recording what you see. The eggs here it was kind of weird. I swear the egg in the back, even though it was farther from me, looked bigger. It must have just been a bigger egg. 
I drew it and it, it didn't look right because I thought, you know, the further something is from you, the smaller it should be. But I looked at the actual eggs and sure enough, the one in the back was just bigger. Um, the drawing of the carton was more difficult to me than drawing the eggs themselves because the eggs are a pretty basic geometric shape. But the carton had all of these different uh, indents and highlights and things. So I go through all of this on a toned ground using medium graphite and then drawing with a 2B pencil. And then I use, after that, an eraser to try and get the highlights and then also the reflected light. Now on the eggs, the highlight is on the left because that the light is coming from the left. And then the reflected light should be on the right edge of the egg. And then in between those two is supposed to be the crest shadow. And this is where it gets tricky because when I drew the shape of the egg and then I erased out the highlights and the reflected lights, it was hard to make that be a smooth transition because these blending areas from highlight into crest shadow and then from crest shadow into reflected light, those aren't hard borders with like a real clear defined line. They're just sort of a blending gradation from lighter to slightly darker, then from slightly darker back to slightly lighter. So I tried using my fingertip to try and blend the graphite a little bit so that those gradations were a little bit more smooth. And then the last step was trying to catch all these other cast shadows from the different uh, surfaces of the A carton in different areas where I hadn't noticed them before. And it uh, kind of just helped to make everything feel a little bit more rounded out. And uh, in the end, this was a pretty satisfying start. The next exercise is to try and recreate an image of Charlie Chaplin that's purely black and white. There are no shades of gray here. The point being, I think, that these black and white shapes, uh, they can make your mind fill in the detail. They're sort of suggesting detail that's not actually depicted. And the instructions for this exercise tell you that you can try drawing this upside down if you want, and that'll help you even more to just focus on the shapes themselves. One of the big points made in the book is that the right side of your brain seems to enjoy filling in these gaps and making recognition of images from clues that are there from shapes that don't have any particular uh, identity outside of the image that you're looking at. Now with this I'm using a charcoal pencil. It's said to use that because you're going to get a blacker black with it. And the trick for me, the thing that I continue to have difficulty with, is getting things in the right spots on the grid using the crosshairs. I'm trying to make sure that I get them the same size and the same position, but as I go along with the drawing, I just tend to get off a little bit. And so proportions start to get out of whack. So that's a challenge that continues to trouble me, but um, the bottom line here with this exercise is that I do see how even drawing shapes that don't have a lot of detail in them and that are purely black and white, you can still have your mind fill in those details. We're all used to seeing faces in lots of different contexts, and so it's easy for our minds to fill in these details where they're only sort of suggested by a pure black shape. And the key here is just to draw the actual shape that's there and let your mind fill in the details itself and not try to create the details on the page if you're not actually seeing them in the example. Uh, another thing that was interesting for this whole exercise was using the charcoal pencil for a full drawing and trying to make it as black as possible. I don't know if it's maybe I have a lower quality charcoal pencils or, or something, but I couldn't get them absolutely pure black. And I was also trying to be really careful not to smudge because the charcoal was even easier to smudge than the graphite. But I think I got the basic lesson that they're trying to communicate with the exercise, but definitely wasn't exactly proud of the result that I came up with here. 
it's a pretty straightforward exercise of just trying to recreate the drawing, but uh, looks like Charlie Chaplin has some sort of uh, face melting disease going on here. But, you know, a uh, lesson learned. Next up was just a real quick exercise to try and reproduce the proportions of a face looking at you in full face view, looking head on. This is just like the exercise in the last chapter where you try to recreate the proportions of a head in profile. It's just to help you to burn in these proportions in your mind as you're drawing it and trying to recreate it, looking back and forth at the model and then trying to draw the same proportions on your own, it helps you to really reinforce in your mind the spacings that are here and to realize some of the uh, true proportions that are different than what you might guess in your mind, that necks are wider than you might think, noses are wider than you might think, mouths are wider than you might think, eyes are lower down on the head than you might expect, and how ears relate, and sort of that gap between where an earlobe starts and where the neck starts is really not that big of a gap, but also that that distance there can make a huge difference in what a person looks like. Another challenge here was trying to make it symmetrical. This is different from when you're drawing in profile view because obviously you only have to draw one eye, one ear in profile view. Here you're trying to draw both sides of the face and make them look fairly symmetrical because that's sort of an element of uh, beauty, really. I mean, if your face is drastically asymmetrical, you will not be considered conventionally beautiful by most people. And once you've finished actually drawing out the proportions, it's helpful to sort of confirm that these spacings really are uh, the proportions that they say in the instructions. And then you can compare the proportions from the model to a real person. And so sure enough, those are just like in real life. Spaces between eyes are the same as the width of the eye, different things like that. So then we move on to a real challenge, trying to recreate a drawing by Pablo Picasso, a self-portrait. You know, no pressure there trying to imitate Pablo Picasso. This uh, drawing is done with a charcoal pencil as well, and you set a charcoal ground for it. It's a pretty dark drawing all overall, and so it makes sense to start with a charcoal ground instead of using graphite. Now, as I was drawing this, I was struck by the, the width of the neck and the shape of the chin, and I found them so striking that I think I mistakenly overemphasized them. I ended up making the neck wider than it needed to be, and the chin more boxy and just generally wider than it was in the original. I sort of ended up drawing, I guess, Pablo Picasso's beefier, sort of less handsome older brother or something. But the slight asymmetries here really make a difference, particularly the eyes. You can see from the crosshairs I've drawn on the original picture that the eyes are not perfectly symmetrical. Uh, one is a little lower than the other one. Uh, also, just the, the way that the eyes are uh, shaded uh, from the top of the eyelid and then underneath the eyeball, sort of where the eye socket is, is sort of indicated by shading there. And um, it's kind of amazing how much uh, depth and reality can be achieved uh, when you know what you're doing uh, using the shading. I do not know what I'm doing, but uh, looking at the original and how he was able to really call forth that that shape that's underneath the eye, that rounded shape in the eye socket with just some deft shading in a, in a sort of curved shape. My version, everything was a little bit more stark. I guess it might have been a, sort of to do with the materials I'm using. Maybe they're just producing a more uh, stark difference on the paper. Maybe I haven't set the proper ground, but everything feels like it's a little bit more 
highlighted rather than a soft gradation. But I was working hard to try and only draw what I saw, particularly around the eyes. Again, I, the eyes I feel like are something we just they make me nervous. I, I, I don't want to mess them up because I feel like if you if you get the eyes completely wrong, then everything else is not going to compensate for that. And so just only trying to draw the whites of the eyes as negative space and as it says in the book to focus on drawing everything around the eye. And if you draw everything around the eye or everything around any particular shape, you will also draw the shape at the same time. So having established all of the darker parts, you then sort of move into using your eraser to catch those highlights and those reflected lights. There are a lot of what seem like stray marks here, or kind of wild marks, but then as you look at the original, you see that all of them have a purpose and uh, all of them really help to set the, the mood, but also to establish the shapes. And my, my marks are random and, and just not as purposeful. But again, just a good exercise to try and uh, replicate a masterwork. Now, the final exercise in this chapter is the one that made me more nervous than anything, because this is the self-portrait that's supposed to pull together all these different s skills that you're supposed to have learned in the preceding chapters, and is supposed to show how much progress you've made. You know, this is on the back of the book. The author shows the before and after self-portraits of students after just a few days of instruction using the principles in the book, how much improvement they've made. So. I feel a, kind of a lot of pressure here to try and do a good job to show that I've actually learned something. Now I've stretched these exercises over a much longer space of time than is probably optimal to uh, learn and retain everything that's being covered in the book. But um, yeah, as I got into this, it, it just uh, felt like every step of it I was very hesitant, but yet I was surprised that I was actually erasing less as I went through than I have in other exercises that, that I've done. Um, and I don't know if that was just a fear that if I erased it and tried it again that I would just make it even worse, but I felt like I was surprised by how quickly this exercise moved. It took me about an hour and a half to do the drawing starting from the very beginning to just complete final touches. Although she's mentions in the book that a lot of students aren't sure exactly when to stop drawing, and she often has to almost take the paper away from them at some point because they, uh, students want to keep adding detail and, and tweaking past the point where they've already captured the likeness in, as well as they're going to. Now, like in other exercises similar to this one, like the profile portrait from the last chapter. I don't know if it's cheating, but I did it a little bit differently than they say in the book. I didn't use a mirror. I took a picture of myself on an iPad, and then I laid the picture plane over that and just used the crosshairs or the picture plane to help orient myself and get proportions and things like that, rather than going back and forth looking at myself in a mirror. It just seemed easier to have a fixed image to work from and not have to keep looking at myself in a mirror and holding that same pose because I feel like any slight changes in the way that you're uh, positioning your head relative to the light will change the patches of light and shadow or the different uh, shape as it's put into a two-dimensional form. Now with the basic shape of my head it's helpful that I don't have any hair so I could get the sort of pure bulbous skull shape and not have to worry about uh, the wavy hair on top. Uh, it's one of the few times that I've been glad to be as bald as I am. It does make it easier to draw. I think I said that when I first draw, drew the uh, before picture of my first attempt at a self-portrait before I had done any of these lessons. Now, as I was working through this, I did the outline of the shape of the head and basic things like ears and then the my shirt like my neckline and that kind of thing then the nose and mouth I sort of edged around 
hesitantly. The last thing I really went for was the eyes. Like I mentioned before with the Picasso picture, the eyes just seem to be uh, a key portion or else they are in my mind where if I can get the eye at least somewhat right, then it'll make the picture that much better. And if I really mess up the eyes, then there's really no hope for the picture at all. So I was hesitant about the eyes and sort of left them for last when I was uh, sketching in these basic details. Now the photo that I took of myself, the lighting was such that my eyes ended up being really dark. There really was no detail at all in the photograph of my eyes. Like they were basically just black spots, which uh, as I was drawing it made me look kind of weird in my mind, but I kept telling myself just to draw what I was seeing in the image and then hoping that the shadows would suggest the details and that your mind would just sort of fill them in. So uh, in the end, I'm not 100% sure that it worked that way, that uh, maybe there could have been a little bit more detail added in there, even if I wasn't exactly seeing that in the photograph. But um, I worried about adding detail that would end up being wrong because I was inventing it rather than just portraying it. Now, uh, with the light spots and the highlights, the reflected lights, I had a hard time making these not look like war paint. I don't know. When I was using the eraser on the face areas that seemed like they had highlights, I just ended up getting these weird streaks and lines rather than fields of light. And so maybe there's some sort of blending or smudging that can be done to help to get those areas more smooth as patches of light rather than looking like I just have these white strips uh, over my cheek and my nose and things like that. I'm not sure. I'll have to work on that in the future. I have to keep reminding myself that this isn't the last drawing I'm ever going to do and most artists end up doing a lot of self-portraits because you always are available to yourself to draw and so it's a ready model that you can work from. So I'm sure I'll try this again in the future and maybe do better, but I think it's somewhat recognizable as me. It's weird. I look at myself in the mirror every day, but yet spending this time actually drawing myself, I was noticing things about my features that I hadn't noticed before. So pretty close. I And here's the comparison with the first try before I had any instruction, and I think there's been some progress there. I'd be interested to hear what people think, I, and I'd also be interested to hear in your experiences about how this has gone for you, this before and after self-portrait progression. But anyway, I, I hope you enjoy this and find it helpful. Take care.